Hey team, Jack Delosa here, founder of The Entourage, and welcome to this episode of the Make It Happen Show. Over the last 12 months, business owners everywhere have had quite a challenging journey in navigating the uncertainty of everything that's been going on in the world. For our 11th birthday here at The Entourage, we wanted to do something about that. We've created a resource center where everything you need, regardless of what stage of business you are at, is in this resource center, whether it's short courses, eBooks for how do you start, how do you grow, how do you scale beyond yourself, how do you build an organization that's scalable and sustainable that can grow beyond you. It is all there. Simply head to www.the-entourage.com slash resources to access everything you need from the world's best entrepreneurs to start growing faster now. Let's get into the Make It Happen show. A lot of people that are very successful in any given field are typically not actually the ones that are subject matter experts in it because they're kind of, I mean, without being like abrasive, they're almost you know, they're almost silly enough to try. You've got to be a bit crazy to try some of the you know the big stuff. I don't think anyone goes into launching a business on day one being like, "Ha, huh, we're going to win today," you know. Um, and the, usually, there's a little bit of naivety, um, and then that's normally kind of shortly shut down, um, and then the real work begins. Yeah, it's not enough to just do things at the surface level anymore. It's just it won't work, like because the consumers are too smart, and the quality of service that they want is is high, which I think is fine. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Make It Happen show. I'm Tim Morris, the CEO at The Entourage, and today I'm joined by Toby Pierce, co-founder and CEO of Sweat. Sweat is a fitness app that's used all over the world. They serve up millions of fitness lessons every single week. So in this session, we talk about how Toby and his co-founder, Kayla, started the business, how they got their first product out there, and then how they started turning it into an app. We learn about how content is really key these days and how they're starting to use machine learning to serve up fitness lessons to you just as Netflix serves up TV shows. It's super interesting. We also talk about how to leave a legacy. As usual, I love this conversation. I always do. Toby really brought something special. Let's get into it. Okay, today I'm joined by Toby Pierce, the co-founder and CEO of Sweat. Toby, how are you? I'm awesome, mate. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, and I hear you're doing a bit of travel at the moment. That must be pretty nice. It, it, it is. It's uh, you know, it's interesting. I think when there's no restrictions, everyone's complaining. Oh, I just don't want to be at home. And then when COVID's around for too long, everyone's like, Oh, yeah, I miss the good old days on the planes in the hotel. Yep. So, no, I think um, uh, the best of both worlds. I think over the last twelve months, but ha- happy to be around and to be able to visit the team abroad again. I think. Yeah. So, where is your team uh, these days? Yeah, so um, we've got uh, two offices uh, at the moment, one in South Australia, which is sort of our you know, original HQ. Uh, and then I think it would have been probably about a year and a, year and a little bit ago, um, we opened an office in Melbourne as well. So um, only very recently, I got to go and see those, you know, those guys and the team over there for you know, the first time in almost a year, um, which was, uh, which was really good. Yeah, wow. All right, so you've had an amazing journey. Like you've come a long way from, um, you know, basically being on the streets to now having this fitness empire. Um, but the thing that really kicked it off was the Bikini Body Guide that I think you launched back in like 2014, one of the biggest fitness publications of the year. And I actually think back in those days, like eBooks were going crazy and you made one that really stood out from the crowd. How did you make that happen? Yeah, yeah. Look, it's a, there's always there's always lots of different reasons why something works, right? There's never ever really just a, you know, the one singular reason. But I think... Um, yeah, I think we, we had kind of the, you know, a, a confluence of really, really positive things, you know, um, playing in our favor at that point in time. You know, we, um, we, we, we had an understanding of our customers that probably wasn't really shared, you know, by other people um, and our competitors. Um, the competitive landscape was much, you know, it was very different then. It wasn't as, it wasn't very sophisticated. It's quite sophisticated now. Um, we were obviously, you know, sort of one of the, one of the early ones, the beginning of that, you know, sort of, I guess, cataclysmic shift in the fitness industry. Um, great timing from a social media perspective, you know, everything was kind of just getting started on Insta, um, you know, and the real boom of ads. Um, and I think, yeah, I think like, uh, really the, the, you know, the, the alignment of being able to understand the customers better and then get to market quicker and with more size and volume than a lot of our competitors was re- really, really, really a great opportunity for us to capitalize upon. And, um, we, we obviously ran pretty hard with it. Yeah. Nice. Where do you remember the, was there a moment when you're like, Hey, this is really taking off? <laughs> well, I mean, honestly, I think like we, yeah, to, to be frank, like I don't think anyone goes into launching a business on day one being like, ha, huh, we're going to win today. 
you know, um, uh, and the, usually there's a little bit of naivety um, and then that's normally kind of shortly shut down um, and then the real work begins. Uh, but I think for us, um, yeah, we, we actually had some really good surprising success sort of, you know, almost immediately after putting the product on the internet, like literally as soon as we hit go. Um, and I think like that was that was good. But I think the thing that became quite, you know, positive about that was that just the, the level of word of mouth we received. Mm-hmm. Um, and for me, that at that point in time, and even still today, like I think is an incredibly good kind of, you know, anecdotal validator for success. Um, you know, if people are talking about your product and talking about it, you know, maybe that's a, a proxy for sort of raving about it. You know, like mm-hmm. you're, you're on you're on to a good run here, you know. Yeah. Um, and so I think for, for me at that point in time, with very limited experience and knowledge, it was still quite obvious that, well, if people are buying it and the people that are buying it are using it and when they're using it, they say that they love it and they tell people, I'm pretty happy, you know, about that. Signs of success. And so when did you start thinking about bringing in technology, building an app, like taking it from, yeah, pretty low low tech version into what you are now? When did that transition start? Yeah, so we, uh, I mean, the, the story goes something along the lines, you know, that basically we'd... Um, We'd run a series of sort of workout events or, you know, like boot camps, uh, if you mm-hmm. will, sort of all over the world. I think probably about five or six countries at that point in time and about 15 cities. And I think we there was a couple of really kind of distinct like learnings that came out of that. And again, you know, another example of sort of anecdotal, you know, validation, right? You know, everyone's sitting there going like, I love this stuff. Like, I wish it just like had a timer, mm. you know, like. You're like, it's an ebook. It doesn't have a timer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, it's, it's a book. Like, you know, what do you expect, right? But, um, you know, and a whole bunch of other product features. But then also it's like, oh, yeah, I love I love these workouts. But, you know, sometimes I just really feel like I just want to stretch or I just want to do a session of yoga. I don't want to do yoga all the time, but, you know, I love high intensity. But sometimes I just feel like i got to stretch, you know, or mm. oh, how, how do I, you know, track my workouts and track my cardio? you know, whatever, right? There's a really big, long list of this stuff. And I think, you know, for us, and, and again, as well, like, and this probably sounds really weird in, you know, 2021, but like not everything was an app, you know, in 2014, mm. 2015, like. Barely remember those days. Yeah, you know, like, it, it, you know, I think at that point in time, Instagram had like was barely supporting videos or hadn't even started supporting videos yet, you know, so this is <laughs> wild, wild west, you know, um, <laughs> as I would refer to it. But um, uh, yeah, and I think from that perspective, you know, we, we basically got like a zero dollar cost great you know piece of research right by traveling mm. around the world talking to people you know you pay a lot of money for that today um and i think off the back of that you know if i'm honest a part of that was like being strategic you know and a yeah. part of it was probably being a little bit naive you know that like oh we'll go in and yeah we'll do this um and yeah and the strategic piece paid off and the naivety came with some costs you know about like what is technology and you know how does it mm. work but but ultimately, those things really were the stimulus for kind of, well, let's get out of ebooks into an app. You know, let's get mm-hmm. out of a single payment into a subscription to bring the price down. You know, let's add these features because they're her jobs to be done that, you know, we have to satisfy for her and her workout journey, right? So, mm-hmm. Yeah, nice. And so had you had any uh, tech development experience at all or was this first time into it? Uh, I think n- nothing really out of, you know, like your basic sort of HTML stuff like on websites, yeah. but I don't even... Not, not to be mean to anyone who's does that type of web development, but I don't really think that of that as like hardcore code, you mm. know, like building like actual applications is code, like building a landing yeah. page is not really the same. Um, and so it was pretty cold start. Yeah. Like pretty, pretty rough start. <laughs> did you, uh, did you make all the usual mistakes like uh, hiring a uh, low cost offshore development firm that made version one of the app that had to get scratched or did, what was your journey? Yeah, I think we got lucky. We got lucky with that, you know, but I think, you know, we got caught in a whole bunch of other traps, you know, building technology for today, not technology for tomorrow, mm-hmm. you know, building features that we wanted um, sometimes that weren't necessarily as equally wanted by members, focusing on things that were probably what we would say, like, you know, form over function when really it should mm-hmm. always be function over form. Mm-hmm. So in other mm-hmm. words, build a thing that works, you know, don't build a thing that looks nice. And so th- these are things you learn early on. And ultimately, I mean, it, it creates two two kind of key cost line items, right? And, you know, one of them obviously being tech debt. You've got to get mm-hmm. rid of it at some point or rebuild it to make it work. Um, but I think the, the invariably more expensive one is actually time. Yeah, like mm-hmm. you, you're missing out on opportunity, right? So it's opportunity cost, if you will. 
Yeah. So what was V1 of the app? What did it, what did it look like? What did it do? How far have you come? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it was ugly. Like, it was ugly. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, I mean, and I, I always say, like, if people don't look back on their first product and say, like, it was terrible, then you launched too late. You know, like yeah. you launched way too late. You got to launch earlier. But um, I, I think, yeah, I mean, it, 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 I don't even, we didn't even have videos. We had images and then we had GIFs and yeah. then we had videos, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, I think we started with sort of like 50 workouts or whatever on there. Yeah, now there's, <laughs> we've got thousands. Um, so, I mean, it's come a long way. Yeah. But, I mean, ultimately, like, you, like I said, if you're not embarrassed, like if you're not mortified by your first yeah. product, then you spent too much money and you wasted too much time. You should have already been live. Yeah, and you've run down a whole bunch of rabbit holes that you probably didn't need to do. And yeah, it's one of the things that um, you know, I suppose we talk about it a fair bit with our members, particularly the more early stage one. But it is a hard learned lesson for a lot of people. We like putting out things that we think are going to be great and perfect and saying, no, 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 get it out there, get some feedback, be a bit embarrassed. It's hard to learn that. So you launched the app and, and pretty quick that was that was successful as well, which is which is a very nice pattern to get into here. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes and no. Um, I think the fir- the first day was terrible. Like we had, uh, I think I've told the story before. You know, twenty five thousand complaints in the first day. Yeah, you know, the app crashing. Well, but at least at least twenty five thousand complaints mean twenty five thousand people tried it. That's right. Yeah, and so I think <laughs> like you know, look from a positivity perspective, we were just glad that people downloaded it. Yeah, you know, and that yeah. they liked it. Um, yeah. But I mean, it, to, to skip past, I guess, kind of all the you know the less kind of sensational detail. Like it was it was pretty horrific for a couple of weeks. But I think mm-hmm. a few weeks in the grand scheme of things, you know, noting that we've been operating for the better part of ten years, mm. really. It's not, yeah. like, I don't really think that's a bad thing. I mean, at the yeah. time, it was not enjoyable, but it's all good now. <laughs> <laughs> Three weeks of pain to, to get to the kind of volume that you've got in terms of user base now. I would I would happily endure that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not on a regular basis, but at least a couple of times. And you've had popularity in a lot of different countries. That's one of the things I've been most impressed by. I suppose that's always the plan, trying to do a, a worldwide app. But um, what kind of complexity came from that? Uh, and then I'm also very interested in where's the strangest place that you guys have been a hit? <laughs> yeah. Um, look, yeah, look, I think in, in terms of the, the complexity piece, well, it's just a, a product of like you don't know what you don't know, right, mm-hmm. when into, up until the point that you do. I think the, the issues, that, you know, that ultimately were caused, uh, you know, by that were, were not actually ones that were kind of problems in the short term. Mm. Um, you know, they, they've almost like become, you know, um, you know, things that we've had to navigate over time. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, like for example, uh, you know, globally, you know, there's a really big opportunity to solve this whole, um, you know, privacy piece. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. and you know, so when you're a business that's born in Australia and you're selling eBooks initially, you kind of go, okay, well, we'll follow that. And then when you go international, all all of a sudden you've got an array more, you know, considerations, you know, that we, we need to be focused on, um, you know, dealing with multi-currency payments, you know, like customer inquiries in 10 languages. Yeah. Like these are things that, um, yeah, when you're a when you're not a first time founder, you know, um, you know to look out for those things, right? But as a first time founder, these are just things that even even kind of in your dizziest daydreams you don't really consider because you kind of go like, oh, like, yeah, you know, how much success is really going to occur in Poland? Mm. Yeah, you know, mm. and then all of a sudden it's it's big, right? So yeah. And you mentioned earlier, like you do go into particularly your first businesses or your first, you know, ventures into a new area with a, an element of naivety. And that's good. I think you need it. Like, and mm. yeah, that probably sounds like really weird. So like, I'll just, you know, kind of clarify. Like, I think one of the biggest like risks you can have is actually being overeducated. Mm-hmm. Like, and that sounds like kind of stupid, right? But you, you see this a lot, like people that are incredibly educated in one particular subject matter field and they've educated themselves into a fixed mindset. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. but like, oh, but I read that this didn't work and I read that that didn't work. But like education that you get from other people is very, or from other books and content is incredibly different, you know, from education that you've effectively learnt yourself or taught yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and like, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's an interesting, you know, kind of perspective, right? Because, a lot of people that are very successful in any given field are typically not actually the ones that are subject matter experts in it because they're kind of, I mean, without being like abrasive, they're almost, you know, they're almost silly enough to try. You've got to be a bit crazy to try some of the, you know, the big stuff. Um, and, you know, and it's interesting because when you don't know everything, you also only focus on the things that present themselves as important. So you don't kind of have priority bias. 
you know, like if you're super educated, you're like, oh, I've got to worry about like all these things when really someone that has no ideas is like, well, that thing is really important today. It's broken or it's not working or it's not liked. And so by default, you end up focusing at least at the beginning of the journey on a lot of really important things. Yeah. Well, just going through your your examples you gave before, if you were worrying on day one, dealing with all those complaints, the bug crashes about support in 10 languages and multi-currency support, you just wouldn't have solved the most pressing problems. And and then you don't even get to them. Yeah, correct. Yeah. 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 And so strangest country that you've had a r- roaring success in? I don't know how you define like roaring success, but I mean, t- to be honest, like I even think like, um, you know, like, perhaps like an example, but like, you know, like traveling through like, you know, random countries, um, you know, in Europe and whatever. Um, uh, and I was in Positano once, you know, like Carl and I in Positano holidaying. And there's a whole, I think it was a group of six girls hiking. We were like 15 Ks off of a walking track. Mm. And there's like six random French girls, you know, in Postano hiking in the middle of nowhere who were like, oh, you're Kayla and Toby. <laughs> yeah, like, so I yeah. think like, to, to me, that's like crazy as like, like how does that even, because no one knew we were there either. So like, how yeah. does that happen? You know? You're like, and you actually know us from sweat and we didn't just do, do something silly in town. And you yeah, yeah, it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so how's the, uh, how's the business evolved? Cause I mean, so how many, how many, how many customers or, you know, average weekly users do you guys have now? Oh, to be honest, I, I wouldn't even be able to you know, tell you that off the top of my head, but I think, you know, we're like, we, we're typically processing, you know, sort of, uh, upwards of several million workouts a month. Like, you know, so there's a lot of activity wow. like going on the platform. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm normally like apprehensive to quote, you know, sort of numbers um, recently because of everything that's changed. The numbers are very, very different, you know, to kind yep. of conventionally what we would see. But, yep. um, but yeah, like, you know, there's, there's millions of workouts happening you know, every 30 days. Like, yeah, you know, that it's, is it's amazing. Going down. Um, so pretty cool. How has the business needed to change to be able to do that? Um, not just like structurally, but what you guys focus on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, like I think... Um, yeah, from from a from a team perspective, right? You know, I mean, I would I would normally always kind of defer, yeah, the structure of the organisation to the strategy, right? Um, mm-hmm. And so, uh, and and then I would kind of say that you know over time and in plenty of businesses like ours, you know, you're constantly going on this sort of like three, six, twelve monthly like evolution journey. Like, mm-hmm. you know, uh, other like a lot much larger organisations can create a strategy and not necessarily like change it as regularly or typically mm-hmm. that's the assumption anyway. It doesn't necessarily mm-hmm. really always stand true. But for us, you know, we've been figuring that out, you know, for the last few years. And it sounds kind of silly because like, oh, well, you're a fitness product and you do workouts. It's like, yeah, okay. But like, but how do we three exercise the company? Yeah, you know, like how does that happen? Like, you know, strategically, like where do we need to be? Who do we need to serve? What content? And then to your point about, you know, structure, it's like, well, and who in the world is going to help us achieve that? And so what's uh, what's taking most of your bandwidth these days? What are you spending your time on? Um, I'm sure there's stuff that you love spending your time on. I'm sure there's stuff that you probably have to love spending your time on. What's keeping you occupied? I'm very sort of, um, you know, like humbled to say that I've been really fortunate over the last probably... I don't know, four to six months to really start to, uh, you know, do what I'd say, like work on the business rather than in the business. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I, I'm actually spending a lot of my time, you know, on strategy at the moment and a lot of time thinking about this content problem and the industry and the trends and, you know, where, where our, you know, category or industry is at from like a maturity and life cycle perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, which, uh, and like I use the word humbling because like I think that can only happen if I've got a, you know, pretty phenomenal team um mm-hmm. you know around me and supporting me and supporting one another so yeah for me uh the last uh, at least the last couple of months for sure you know we're sitting here being like okay well covid hit that didn't really change the industry it just accelerated the trend but if it accelerated mm-hmm. the trend then that means we've effectively gone into the future so what was going to be the future is now kind of today so we're sitting here, I'm, I'm kind of going, okay, well, what's going on in the industry? How is the industry categorized? How is the structure of our industry changing? Who are going to mm-hmm. be the winners? When are the winning, when is the winning going to happen? And how is it going to happen? You know? So touching on that, what do you think um, the shifts or the changes in the fitness industry are? Yeah. Yeah. No, look, I, I think um, I, I'm like fascinated about this in general. I mean, I, I, did, I personally, like, I just love business, but like, you know, when I look at kind of what's going on at the moment in our space, you know, we're really, you can kind of dissect the industry by saying, well, you know, there's, there's this big lump that is the fitness industry and all the revenue that's made in it. 
you know, and there's a massive portion of that's in retail, you know, so like mm-hmm. boutiques and gyms and um, health pubs. So we can, that's one side. And you kind of go, you've also got this other relatively gigantic side, which is kind of like hardware, you know, so like mm-hmm. actual equipment, you know, bikes, cable machines, mirrors, you know, all these sorts of, you know, fancy products of sale. And then you've got these other two, you know, kind of large, um, uh, you know, battles going on where you've got feature related products. So they don't sell content, they don't sell hardware, they're not a retail environment, they're just features. So think of Strava, for example, mm-hmm. they just mm-hmm. track data. They don't have mm-hmm. anything else other than features, but that's how they monetize and data. Um, and then you've got the content players. Um, and then inter- the interesting shift is that over the last couple of years, they started to become hybrids. You know, so there's these companies that will have a workout tracking platform that will plug into their workout content machine, which then delivers to the hardware, right? Mm. Yeah, and so we've got these hybrids, um, yeah, which are really starting to evolve. So from this perspective, I think probably what's quite likely to happen is that revenue is going to shift between sources, mm-hmm. you know, a lot. Um, yeah, I think, and I also think that the, the space of, you know, retail, you know, kind of as we conventionally know, I, I think is going to undergo quite a significant change um, mm-hmm. for fitness. You know, the, the typical 24-7 gym membership is probably going to be around for a very long time, but it's going to be very mm-hmm. different, I think, in five years' time. Mm. And is that because of the all the changes from COVID, like people being out of cities and, and maybe not even wanting to go into gyms as much? I don't know what's going on there. I think it's the acceleration around, um, you know, like what people are actually doing, you know, like, because people only have, you know, X dollars to spend, right? Like on their health, or at least that's their perception, right? That's how much they prioritize to spend. Um, and the reality is that, you know, gyms are effectively a leased equipment. You know, like really the majority of fitness experiences are carrying gyms are using the equipment. You know, um, personal trainers are only training a very small portion of, you know, the clientele of a gym, right? Um, and so as equipment becomes more normal to have at your house, and as content becomes more important to motivate people to work out, the value proposition definitely shifts, you know, for gyms, becomes very different. Boutiques have a slightly different problem um, because as, you know, content preference and flexibility and price battles continue, what has upstood the boutique model is their ability to charge high price. Like that's mm-hmm. why they're mm-hmm. so profitable, high price, low setup cost, right? Yeah. Yeah, so the economics will shift. And these are not going to be things that are going to happen like in a day. You know, these, these are things that are going to take years to change um, as the industry changes, as the consumer behavior changes, but they're, they're kind of invariable, like they will happen. It's just a matter of how much and when. Hey team, Jack again. Just another invitation to make sure you're jumping into our resource center to be guided by the world's best entrepreneurs for how you can grow and scale great companies. Head to www.the-entourage.com slash resources to make it happen. Now, let's get back into the show. Well, and also, as you said earlier, there's been acceleration. Like that's one of the things that last year's done. It's just it's just made all these trends that were going on anyway just happen faster. Um, so I'd love to touch on content a little bit more because like we are in a content world um, and you're in a content space. Uh, so so what's going on there? What's what's changing? What are you paying attention to? Yeah, yeah. Look, I think um, I think for as I mentioned, so you know, one of the industry pillars is content. Um, that's obviously a space we play in. Um, yeah, I think there's. Uh, I think I think the, con- the, the the convention that existed, you know, probably eighteen months ago, um, or the assumption rather, uh, you know, oh yeah, like filming some workouts and putting on the internet or in an app is like pretty straightforward. Like that's basic. We'll do it right. I think COVID kind of unvalidated that um, <laughs> because when it happened, every trainer you know in the world needed a place to put their content. They've gone and done that, and then they've realised, oh crap, this is actually really hard. You know, yeah. um, and, and so the market kind of went through like a very acute saturation phase, you know, as a mm-hmm. result of that. Um, I think for us, you know, like where we, we would normally frame this up quite simply, you know, and that is that we're trying to figure out what is the right content to create? How do we get that content to the right customer? And how do we create the right experience to consume it? It's mm-hmm. really like, it's actually super simple in yeah. theory, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once you get in the detail. Correct. But like, what is the right content? Yeah. Who mm-hmm. is the trainer? What workout are they doing? What exercises? You know, what structure? How long? What equipment? What body parts? You know, like what style? There's there's an array of variables there. Um, and then in terms of the delivery of that, you know, programs, individual workouts, on demand content. You know, like there's 
the, the, there's a there's a, such a massive you know matrix of like criteria here and the reality is that in today's day and age people want what they want and if you don't mm-hmm. have what they want then they're gone and you know companies like netflix and spotify know this and that's how they dominate because their content we would normally refer to it as content breadth you know categorically mm-hmm. and then content depth you know within a category they just master it but like they're just yeah. absolute they're absolute scientists at the content game and no one knows so what, so like dive into this a little bit deeper, what kind of technology do you need to actually sort of say, look at these millions and millions of workouts that you're serving? How do you capture the data, analyze it, and then present more tailored content to a user? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the, 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 recommend, the recommendation part is relatively straightforward, provided that you've got the correct infrastructure in place, you know, so i.e. if people are consuming content, if you have the ability to able to determine what it is that they're consuming, match that to a consumer's profile, mm-hmm. uh, there's an array of different really clever ways you can work with data to effectively bring that to life, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think the, uh, you know, part of the, the science here really is, you know, using using the data and different types of data. So like, you know, quantum and qual, right? Um, what's happening? What's being consumed? Why is it being consumed and who is it being consumed by? You know, that's one big opportunity to understand. But the second one is obviously then, well, we have all these people coming to our platform. They see all the same content, but they're not consuming it. Why? Right? Because there's a really, really simple assumption we can make. And that is that every single human being that downloads a fitness product probably has the intent to do some fitness stuff. Right, right, yeah. Um, but not everyone does, right? And even yeah. those that do, not everyone does it forever. But I think every mm-hmm. single person, even very healthy people, want to be active. Like it's it's good for your brain, it's good for your body, it's good for your social life and your confidence and all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. So you know, the better part of the population want to do it. But wanting to, you know, like typically, typically I would say people's like intent and their behavior are like grotesquely unrelated, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and so part of our issue, like, is that we can solve a lot of those barriers with content, you know, mm-hmm. like so having a workout delivered by somebody who you like, right? Mm-hmm. Or someone that has a personality you like. Some people kind of want to be yelled at, you know, they want to <laughs> be drill sergeanted, right? You know, some people want to be inspired and motivated gently, right? Mm-hmm. Some people don't want to be talked to. Some people just want to be shown what to do and that's going to work out, right? Yeah. And so like, it's our job to understand all those different personalities and all those different people and all the different training categories to make sure that we can service them and provide them all because no one wants the same thing. Well, and that's where it starts getting pretty exciting, isn't it? It's like, um, yeah, if I think back to different trainers or people that I work out with, you like, you like different people for different reasons, but it's very hard. You can't put your finger on it often. And also it's kind of like, I, I either like that person or I don't. And so it's like one shot to get it right. Whereas what you guys can do, though, is you can actually do it, like keep on trying something else. Keep it, all right, it doesn't like that style, let's try something else. Doesn't like that style, let's try something else. All in the one place. It's, it's sort of like saying, you know, the, the, the really, really kind of like blunt example is like, you don't go to Netflix and they don't only have one action movie and one comedy movie and one mm. horror and one whatever, right? You know? Like they've got a category for like medieval action movies set in the 1300s in China. Yeah, like yeah. that's that's the degree of specificity they go to. And for us, it's the same. We can't just have, oh, here's, you know, here's a 12-week high-intensity program. Yeah, yeah. We, we've got to have tens or hundreds of those. Yeah, it's a good analogy though, the Netflix one, because it's like when I log into Netflix and what I'm presented with is completely different to when my wife logs into Netflix and what she's presented with. Um, and so, you know, it may not be actually, you know, couples – log into the same app, but two different people need different stuff presented to them. Is that where you think you're, or you or the industry is getting to, just getting so smart that every single time someone interacts or actually consumes a different style of workout, it then changes the kind of content you put forward to them? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you f- from a really big picture perspective, like the dynamic we see is just kind of like constant like inflate and deflate, you know, of different like categories. Like so... Yeah, you know, when there was yeah, when there was like massive opportunity in TV, like every yeah, you know, every man and the dog had a TV channel and a TV business, and they're creating content trying to sell it to TV stations, right? Mm. Yeah, you know, and then the evolution of that industry, obviously, eventually we've kind of landed you know with um, companies like Netflix and the like, who are effectively far more intelligent, you know, in the way that they're approaching content creation, right? Mm. Um, 
However, then we start to see that as we get much, much, much smarter, and in this case, in, in Netflix's, you know, the entertainment industry, you see other competitors are also equally smart and they look for their slice of the pie. And mm. really what Netflix is doing, or at least striving to do, you know, is match like the, the, uh, match a large volume of the most specifically relevant content to a specific, uh, particular like audience segment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so like a great example of this in their space is, well, Disney, right? Yeah, Disney Plus. They've basically Mm -hmm. done what Netflix has done, but for a very, very, very sharp, you know, like portion of the audience, which Netflix probably serves, but they don't specifically dominate and serve that audience, right? Whereas that's all that Disney does, right? It's a core competency of theirs. Um, And it's it's super relevant, right? Funnily enough, uh, so we recently signed up to Disney Plus and there's some things I really love about it, like the narrow selection of content. Like some, sometimes you're just like, I do not want to scroll through a million different titles and just have indecision. It's like, I'll jump on there because it's like one or two things that I might want to watch and away we go. So it is that cycle of innovation, isn't it? It's like um, someone will start it off. Netflix has started off in this situation, right? They're the ones that really started tailoring content. Everyone else jumps on. And so what is next? Like how does someone stand out from that next? I'm, I'm sure that's what you're paying attention to now in the fitness industry. How do you get ahead? Yeah, it's just specificity. Like, I really think that specificity is key. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and like, and, and and this is a theme. You know, this is a theme can be linked to a whole bunch of things, whether it be kind of directly or philosophically. You know, like specificity in your business, like focus on the thing that you are good at, and when you become absolutely world class at that thing, then you can do something else. But until you are absolutely great at it, don't you know, don't deviate. You know, no different to the content thing. It's like you have to find content that is specifically relevant to that audience, and that can't be like oh, this is just content that like women like, Mm -hmm. you know, like the science is, you know, people are too smart and too specific these days, you know, who, who is she, you know, like how old is she? How much money does she make? What, what, like, you know, what social group does she, you know, belong herself to, right? What attitude does she have? What media does she consume? Who does she follow on social media? What music does she like? What movies is she going to? You're like all these type of information. There is, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of segments just within one characteristic you know it's not it's not enough to just yeah it's not enough to just do things at the surface level anymore it's just it won't work like because the consumers are too smart and the quality of service that they want is is high which i think is fine well yeah there's a level of uh, sophistication with the consumers also it's like are they talking to me and and you're only talking to someone if you're like so when i talk about customer avatars with our members it's like you need to know your avatar like you know your best friend. Like you know all your best friend's pain points, the things that are going to drive them crazy, the things you can help them with. All right, if you're down to that level, you're starting to get it. Um, You actually mentioned, uh, uh, I think whether you used the term avatar, it was something very similar earlier about like um, once you've got all these data points about what they consume, you can match them up to an avatar. Um, Do do you have a a huge number of avatars in Sweat? Is it something you're, you're developing are they actually codified? How does that work? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like f- from our perspective, obviously, we we, we yeah, our approach right here, yeah, really is like understanding first, like if we had to categorize, you know, people on yeah you know, and members or our audience in that way, how would we do it? Mm-hmm. You know, so like through a- across what criteria? So before, like I you know, rambled a couple of examples that you would normally see, like out of a marketing book, right? Like you'd look at demographics, psych psychographics behaviors and attitudes and other like specific subject related related criteria so for us if you get outside of you know demographics and psychographics and stuff we're obviously looking at fitness related stuff you know so why mm-hmm. is she training what are her goals mm-hmm. you know what style of training does she want to do how much is she training how much experience does she have training you know the, the, these are the sorts of criteria that outside of the more generic ones that you know we're definitely looking at um and from our perspective, that's to your point. I think you know the you know we're trying to create a yeah you know, a brand for her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, like and, and normally in the brand world, you you can you sometimes even see that as a metric of success. Yeah, you know, like is this a brand for me? Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. is this a brand I trust? You know, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Like in order to achieve those things or to 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 rank well on those things, like the specificity is key. So it's the uh, the pursuit of specificity. I think is the key thing I'm taking away from this conversation. Trademark that one. <laughs> we can all chase it. All right, I've got a couple more. Uh, I've got a couple more questions here uh, that neither of us have uh, have seen, and we try and get through these ones in uh, in a reasonably good pace. I do have to admit, I'm I'm pretty bad at going off on tangents. 
<laughs> no, likewise, mate. Likewise. <laughs> <laughs> so no real pressure on the time. But uh, we try and make these happen in a minute or so. Um, got five questions here. Uh, first one is, what's been your favourite fitness-related goal that you have achieved in your own lifetime? Ah, oh, okay. Uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, blue belt. Oh, awesome. How did you get into that? See, we're, in, we're on tangents already. <laughs> yeah, uh, I decided that I wanted to do something that I was really shit at. Um, like from, <laughs> from a, it was honestly like deliberately, it was a mental and emotional experiment of mine, you know, like how can I put myself into a position of weakness to learn, you know, how to handle that basically. Wow. Awesome. Very philosophical answer to that as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Question number two, uh, who is an entrepreneur that you look up to? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, there's a there's a guy uh, there's a guy called Naval. Um, he runs a podcast. Um, mm-hmm. uh, he's quite well known, but I, I, he's not sort of like one of the prolific like Warren Buffett or Elon Musk or whatever. But I think um, yeah, he, he's he is fascinatingly intelligent. Yeah, and I mm-hmm. think like listening to his story and his perspective on things, like I yeah, I really really look up to him. So if anyone does podcasting, you know, go on to the podcast on the Apple Podcasts and type in Naval N A V A L. He's he's very very good. Awesome. I'll check him out. Uh, question number three, what is something you like to do outside of either business or fitness? Uh, uh, piano. I like to play piano and read. Yeah, great. When did you start playing piano? Uh, I was probably about three, maybe three years, three and a half, four years old maybe. Yeah. Nice. I am, uh, I think what you, you would call musically illiterate. <laughs> I, I, I like to call myself practicing. I'm constantly practicing. <laughs> practicing. It's like uh, me. So I'm a pretty keen surfer, but I do describe myself as thoroughly intermediate. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, question number four. Uh, what do you think is one advantage Aussie business owners have over other countries? Um, less bias. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have less bias. And why, what do you mean by that? Well, because I think in America, everyone's an entrepreneur. Everyone's got mm-hmm. a great idea. Everyone's got access to capital, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like we're less biased because we're kind of almost on the outside of that, which um, which has pros and cons, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think like if you look at it through a positive perspective, like I think it's great because to us, by not being biased, kind of like mm-hmm. I mentioned earlier on when we we're talking, you know, it allows us to kind of our own organic journey. We don't self-educate our way out of things. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that connects right back to that. Good one. All right, last question I got here, and then I'll, I'll, I'll certainly have a wrap-up one for you as well, is if someone wanted to build a business empire with a lasting legacy, what's the one thing they need to do to make it happen? Have a cause worth working for. Yep. Uh, do you think that is at the heart of every successful business? Well, no, but I think so, because I think the question was phrased right as in like, you know, something that is a lasting legacy, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so I think like, and yeah, and, and perhaps this is like a little dystopian and yeah, like hyper commercial, right? But like a lot of businesses are just around to make money, but like they're not mm-hmm. they're not here to you know have a lasting legacy. And there's you know a lot of people would hear that sentence and go like, oh, that's a bit you know a bit sharp. But it's like the world runs on money, and money does a lot of great things for the world. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I don't just mean philanthropy, but you know like yeah, like medical research, yeah, like uh, like advances in technology that comes from money right yeah so but if we like yeah leaning back to the question around like creating a legacy it's like well if your goal is to you know build a business and like have a legacy it's like first the business has to be centered around a cause that is actually like really truly worthwhile you know so like elon musk is probably a you know a great example of that right like he's going to create a legacy of intergalactic travel and space right like that's Mm. going to be a thing yep yeah yeah and it's got a it's got a it's got to be bigger and last longer than the founder um, in fact, actually, that's, that might be just one area that we haven't touched on this conversation. I might like to just touch on before we finish. So, uh, I mean, you know, Jack Delosa, the founder of the Entourage. We, we're a, a founder-led brand, and Musk is another example. And uh, for you guys, with with a face um, through Kayla, you know, there's a, a, a face there. How do you build something that is bigger um, than just a founder-led brand? What? Because I think you guys are, are at that level. What are the keys to that? Yeah, yeah. Look, I think um, it's actually super interesting, right? Because there, there's, there's sometimes there's debate the debate around like, oh well, yeah, we don't want to attach something too much to an individual because you know, like, well, what if something bad happens to them, or what if people don't like them anymore, or you know, whatever, right? Yeah. Um, 
but then like you know it's a it's an insane strength right because like people yeah if you just said you know if you had an anonymous masked individual was like yes we're going to space hurrah <laughs> you know like the world would find it really difficult to you know kind of link to that you know so i think um you know, I think like if you know using like individuals or having individuals as these you know like pioneers you know like for businesses and brands I think is I think yeah in many ways can be incredibly effective um, and I think yep. in terms of you know, like actually making it work like well you know I, I think like a lot, a lot of that really comes down to pretty standard 101 you know brand and marketing principles right like people have to trust a business and if you're using a person to brand a business they've got to trust that person that but they don't need to trust that that person is necessarily a great person but they need to trust that that person is going to make sure that they'll deliver on you know the business's promise musk is a good example of that one again it's like i believe that he will get um spacex and and people to mars <laughs> you know whether he will do that in an orthodox way <laughs> yeah like you might you might not like him but like at the end of the day, like his KPI, like his key performance indicator is not making friends. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, and, and, that, and that sounds, again, like, you know, forgive me, I've said a couple of things that are probably a bit savage today, but like his KPI is not making friends, right? Because yep. I can guarantee you if his KPI was making friends, he wouldn't be going to space. Yeah. Because yeah. most of the people around him probably for the last 10 years have been telling him he's crazy. Yeah. And what you also do hear, you hear the stories coming out of, you know, any of his businesses, people say, um, we work bloody hard and he's a hard taskmaster, but we're going to get there. And it's because of that. Yeah. 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 Like, and this is, this is the thing, right? Like, again, like, I mean, you, they answered the asked question before about like legacy. It's like, not everyone cares about your legacy. Mm. So if your KPI is building the legacy, you've got to accept the fact that that's going to be a reality of your life. You know, I mean, you guys would deal with this, I'm sure every day, you know, you said, no, your customer, right? And anyone who has ever built a business of any size, it doesn't matter if you're working 80 hours a week building a cafe or 80 hours a week getting to space, you're still working 80 hours a week. Mm. And you're working 80 hours a week on something that is entirely independent. You know, it's, to, it's yours, it's your thing. No one else is going to give a crap about that. Mm -hmm. And that's actually quite emotionally confronting, like as individuals, mm. as you go on your journey, because to your point before about passion, you love it. You want to build a legacy or you want to build something to serve your purpose, family, whatever it might be, but no one else really cares. And it's really hard. If you're going to be spending the effort and spending the energy, make sure you're doing it on something that um, A, is meaningful to you, uh, but also, yeah, has the chance of making an impact. Yeah, you got to you got to swing big, right? Like you don't want to, you, no, no, no one swings lightly, like just in case they hit the ball. You know, like you, you, the goal is always to hit a home run, right? Like we're not just here to tap, right? Yeah. So. Awesome. Toby Pierce, I really love the conversation. We've gone uh, from the from the early days through to, um, I think I can see how you guys are revolutionizing the industry. Bit of philosophy in there as well. Loved it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, man. It was great to chat. Always good to catch up with you guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, cheers. Great to have you on. Bye. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Make It Happen Show. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. And it doesn't need to end there. We've actually gone and grabbed a whole bunch of extra resources for you. Behind the scenes footage, videos from this and all the other episodes, as well as show notes that you can grab for free. Just head along to www.the-entourage.com slash podcast and you can grab all those extra resources. Thanks for tuning in and I cannot wait to introduce you to our next guest on the next episode.